I've been using Photoshop for over 20 years, and I've been using Lightroom since it came out. And I would say when Lightroom came out is when I got my frustration level with adjusting my photographs uh, in general went down uh, dramatically. And the ease with which I could adjust my images and the speed with which I could do it really went up. And so I want to share with you some of the things that really excite me about using uh, Lightroom and get it so that you really know most of what Lightroom can do and you know it at a level where you can be efficient with it. And before we get into that though and I show you how to adjust things, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of how I think about Lightroom and just a few of the details you might have to deal with uh, before we actually get in working with our pictures. Uh, so I have Lightroom running right now and I'm just going to use it to switch between a few images. Then we'll end up starting off with an empty Lightroom catalog as if you just installed Lightroom and you don't have anything installed yet. And we'll just start from there and slowly progress. Uh, so let's uh, get into it. All right, so the way I think about Lightroom is, in fact, I'm going to do this from Bridge so I don't have an overlay. Okay, the way I think about Lightroom is you have your original images, and usually they come in one of three formats. And those formats would be images you already have existing on your hard drives that you shot in the past years. I call that your photo archive. You have memory cards that you just might have finished shooting that you need to somehow get copied over to your computer and dealt with. And then you have live shooting. And some people it would be appropriate to shoot directly into Lightroom because you might need to either adjust those images immediately. Let's say you're at an event, a live event and it needs to go to a wire service, a news service, uh, to report on the event. Uh, or maybe you're shooting something in the studio and you just want to get a much better view of your image instead of the little one on the back of your camera. So you might want to uh, connect your camera directly to your computer, shoot right into Lightroom, and we'll talk about all three of those. So those are what we might start with. When we're done, usually we, we want to use those images for various purposes. These are the ones that we're going to be talking about. So just to take a glance at them, digital files might be something you need to email to somebody, upload to your website, that kind of thing. Uh, you might need to make prints either on your printer at home or send it off to a, a company that does that for you. Create a website with your images, uh, do slideshows of your images, upload them to social media like Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, that type of thing. Create a portfolio on your iPad so you can hand it to somebody else or create something like a photo book. Uh, which is what I happen to have uh, here because I created one, uh, or I should say my wife Karen created one about our wedding. Uh, and she made this a matter of, I think it was like three or four days ago, and we already have it printed here in our hands uh, because of what we can do with Lightroom. So in general, this little uh, diagram just says this is what we might start with. These are the things we want to end up with. And in between is Lightroom. Lightroom's going to make it much easier to deal with all those things. But there's a few things you need to think about with Lightroom. In Lightroom, we can preview things. So we can look at the images we just shot to see if maybe they have good focus or to just see if they're usable. We can find and organize them. So we can set up something where if we want to do a quick search to find an image, we can get to it right away, uh, that type of thing. And then we can edit and adjust there. And that's what we're all going to be talking about in Lightroom. One concept, though, is unlike other software, like for instance, if you own Photoshop, Photoshop comes with Bridge for browsing your files, looking at thumbnails. Most other programs uh, that might come on your computer would be what's known as a, what I might call at least, a browser. And a browser is something that is just going to show you the contents of your hard drive and preview what's there. So instead of seeing file names, you'd see pictures, thumbnail, little images. And the problem with the browser is it's just like a web browser. With a web browser, if you're not live on the internet, you can't do much with it. It only can show you what you're live connected to. With Lightroom, on the other hand, it's a catalog program. So in order to see anything within Lightroom, the first thing we're going to need to do is import our images. When we import our images, Photoshop is going to create thumbnail images and previews that it will store. And when it stores those, that means we're going to be able to browse our images and we're going to be able to semi-organize our images even when our hard drive that contains our pictures is not connected to my computer. 
Whereas a lot of other programs that are designed for previewing images, if you don't have the hard drive connected that has those images, then you can't look at them at all. Just like a web browser, you can't do anything unless you're connected to the internet. Uh, so anyway, this is just a little bit of an overview. The light uh, colored lines pointing towards the right um, represent importing. We got to do that before we can see our images. The dark colored lines on the right represent exporting, which is what we're going to need to do in order to use them for all these other purposes. Because uh, the things we do in Lightroom are stored in little bitty files that just contain some text. It will say, you moved this adjustment slider a certain distance, and it just saves that information. It doesn't actually change your picture. It stores your picture and a little description of what you've done to it in Lightroom. And in order to get that to permanently change your image or to give it to somebody else with those changes uh, included in the file, you'll need to export them to give them to people or to use them for these various purposes. Just so you know, with this course, we're working on some um, support materials so that if I talk about something in Lightroom and go over it quickly and don't get back to it for a little while and you're trying to figure out what was that option he used or uh, where do I find various things, uh, my wife Karen is working on a little guide. I'll just show you an example of a page or two in that guide. Here's one that shows you a little bit about navigating in Lightroom. It would tell you what the various interface components do. And on the back page, it would show you some keyboard shortcuts that are essential when working in certain areas of Lightroom. And she's creating a bunch of those, as well as more detailed information, like talking about adjustments. Instead of just having a diagram with arrows calling out, it will actually have paragraphs of text that describe what do various adjustments do. And that way, you don't have to completely rely on remembering what I do here. Instead, if you purchase the course, you can look at that support material, and it'll really help you stay up to speed on, on uh, what we're up to. So what I'd like to do is head over to Lightroom and I want to give you an idea of what Lightroom is capable of. Just so you know, this is not my computer. This is Creative Live's computer. And as far as I know, Lightroom is set up in its default configuration because I haven't touched it before I walked up to it here. And so hopefully whatever I do here uh, will reflect what you would have if you have a new copy of Lightroom and we'll just slowly progress as far as talking about features. All right, so one of your alternatives to using Lightroom would be to use Bridge in Adobe Camera Raw. If you happen to own Photoshop, Photoshop comes with a program called Bridge and comes with a plugin called Adobe Camera Raw, which I'm representing here with the letters ACR. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between those two. First off, I mentioned earlier the type, that Bridge is a browser, meaning it can only show you what is actively connected to your computer. And if you disconnect the hard drive, it can no longer show you that information. Lightroom is a cataloging program instead. It creates thumbnails and previews for your images. You can disconnect your hard drive later on, leave with your laptop, and you can still show your friends your images. There are some things you can't do, though, if you don't have the hard drive there. You can't make an adjustments, and you can't print the images in general because it needs the high-resolution original images. With Lightroom, it contains 100% history of everything you've ever done to an image, from the date you imported it to every adjustment you've done. Whereas if instead you were to work with Bridge and Adobe Camera Raw, which is one alternative, um, there's minimal history. The, when you're adjusting an image, you can choose undo a few times to go back a few steps, but the moment you hit the done button, it no longer remembers the order in which you applied your adjustments, and there's no great way of going back just a few steps. It just remembers what your end result looked like. I've mentioned offline viewing. That means if your hard drive's not hooked up, that um, Bridge can't do it, but Lightroom can. Other things, as far as I put in a category called utility, and there I said Bridge has slight utility in that it has some semi-useful features, but Lightroom has much more. You can tr keep track of your images on a map, you can print books, you can do a website, uh, and a lot of other things. I think Bridge is semi-user friendly, but I find Lightroom to be much more streamlined and just uh, a joy to use. Uh, other things that you have to think about is that 
Bridge completely reflects what you do on your hard drive. If you change the name of a file on your hard drive without using Bridge, Bridge is going to reflect that. If you delete a file, Bridge will reflect that. Add another file to a folder, Bridge will show you that. That's not the case with Lightroom. And this is one of the disadvantages of using Lightroom. Lightroom will only show you the images that you have imported to it. In any changes that you make outside of Lightroom, Lightroom's not going to know about unless you do something specific to get it to go and reinvestigate your hard drive to see if anything's changed. We'll talk about how to do that. But it is something that you'd have to change mentally because if you change something on your hard drive when Lightroom's not running, switch over to Lightroom and expect it to be there, it's not going to be until you do something to tell it to relook at your hard drive. Then another thing is um, down here that Lightroom can completely repri replace Bridge and Camera Raw, the two parts that come with Photoshop, but it's not a replacement for Photoshop itself. There are a lot of things that Lightroom can't do and you'll still need Photoshop or other software to do if you need to push your files and do things like much more complex retouching or if you need to stitch a panorama or if you want to merge more than one picture together into something known as HDR. It just doesn't have the capability built in. And so we'll keep that in mind and we'll talk about it when we run into those limitations. All right, let's look at some before and afters. Here are some images that I've shot and I'm just going to show you two versions of the file. What it looked like before it was adjusted, that's the way it looked right after it came off the camera, and what it looks like after I've adjusted it using Lightroom. Some of these images were adjusted with older versions of Lightroom, some were adjusted with the newest version of Lightroom. It's just a wide variety of examples. And so this one was taken in Iceland and I thought what came out of my camera looked interesting but kind of boring because it just doesn't have much pizzazz when it comes to color and contrast. Here's what the end result looked like after using Lightroom. And it depends on what it looks like on your web feed. Sometimes the saturation's a little different and all that. It takes me a while to get used to what you guys are seeing versus what I see on my uh, computer, but we'll take a look. Here's another one taken in Iceland. And here's the end result. Just made the color pop a little bit more before, after. Here's one taken in California, which I thought was lacking shadow detail in the garage that's there and the highlight detail in the bottom right was just way too bright but after Lightroom I was able to really fix that up. We'll learn exactly how that's done to fine-tune those. This one was taken in Dubai. I know we have at least one person uh, from D Dubai. Actually this is Abu Dhabi. Um, this is the Grand Mosque. Um, I got into a a uh, car accident and a taxi cab right there, uh, which was a rather interesting story. But anyway, here's the original image. Here's my end result coming right out of Lightroom. So you notice that I used a fisheye lens here, which caused certain elements to be curved. And I tried to correct for that in the end result and optimize the color and contrast. This one here was taken in Iceland. Now we have at least one person in Iceland uh, also there. And uh, out of my camera, it didn't look like that most exciting image. But after Lightroom, I could make quite a big difference. Uh, this one is in Southeast Asia uh, at a temple before, after. And so we'll talk about how to do all those kinds of changes. One thing I'm somewhat amused by is sometimes people will say about their images, to try to say they're not manipulated, uh, is that they only used Camera Raw or they only used Lightroom. And as you can see from these images, you can make dramatic changes in Lightroom. I should also mention that the adjustment sliders that you find within Lightroom are identical to those that are found in Adobe Camera Raw. So if you own Photoshop, it, it comes with the plugin called Adobe Camera Raw. You could open the images in there and apply the same adjustment sliders. You won't have the advantage of cataloging your images and be able to organize them in the ways that we're going to talk about. So I, also when you're applying the adjustments, it's a much more streamlined interface to do so. It's a much more pleasant experience. So hopefully that gives you some sense of the potential uh, in Lightroom. Okay? Now with Lightroom, when you first load it up, it's just going to show you an empty catalog. So here I'm going to act as if I haven't used Lightroom before. I'll go to the file menu and choose new catalog. If you're following along at home and you already have a catalog, you already have images in it, just go with what you have. 
Uh, I'm just going to start from fresh, just so I don't make any assumptions as far as what you know. And I'll just call my catalog, I'll just call it my name, Ben Wilmore. And I tell it where to put it and hit create. Just take a moment. It pretty much closes the catalog I already had open and then goes to open that new one. Usually it goes a little faster than this, but there we go. We have a new catalog. Now there's a couple things I did when we worked with the previous images. I hid some side panels. I'm going to make those show up. They're just little triangles on the edge of my screen that I'm clicking on to get those to show up. This is what it might usually look like when you just open it fresh. So there are going to be no images in here because it's a cataloging program and in order to catalog something you need to import it. That's when it's going to create thumbnails and uh, previews. To do so, you can either go to the lower uh, left corner where you find an import button or if you prefer working with menus, you can go to the file menu at the top and you will find a choice called import photos and video. It does the same thing as clicking the button in the lower left. Oh, and usually this top panel would be visible, so that's a little more like it. So I'm going to click that import button in the lower left. On the left side, it shows me the contents of my hard drive. And so I'm going to come in here and see if I can find where my desktop is, because that's where my files are. And I'm just navigating to where I have some images to import. All right, here I found a folder of images. I've just clicked on its name. And all I've been doing here is clicking on the various triangles that are here to expand uh, folders until I can find where my images are stored. If you happen to have your images stored on your desktop, uh, you might have to go through the name of your hard drive if you're on a Mac, and then to the word users and whatever your username is before you find your desktop, just in case you're not used to uh, trying to locate that. So anyway, here I have a bunch of images that I shot in a slot canyon. And this slot canyon is called Antelope Canyon. It's near Page, Arizona, which is near the Utah-Arizona border. And it's hard to take a bad picture in there in general. Um, it's an amazing spot to visit. So once I've clicked on the name of the folder that contains the images I'd like to import, over here I'll see thumbnails for those images. And you'll find that each thumbnail has a checkbox uh, next to it. And that's just to say which images would you like to import, which would you not. So if you happen to have some images in here that have nothing to do with slot canyons, maybe you have just a random picture of you know, your car or something else that you don't want in here, you could turn off the checkbox for any one of these images to say you wouldn't like to import them. Uh, or you can go down here and say check all or uncheck all to say do you want to start off with them all unchecked? and therefore you tell it to only import maybe two or three images. Or in my case, I'm just going to say check all uh, to make sure it gets them all. At the top of my screen, it says what do I want to do with those files? And I have four choices. Add means it's going to leave the files where they are on my hard drive. It's not going to move them around at all. Move would physically move them to a different folder on my hard drive. We'll talk about that later. That's useful if you have a compact flash card or uh, just any card out of your camera. And you want to clear off the card, get the images onto your computer, you can choose move. Copy is similar to move, uh, but it's going to leave the original in its original location, whereas move would delete the originals, moving them to the uh, new location. And copy as DNG is something we'll talk about later on, probably in the second or third day, most likely the third day. So right now I'm just going to choose add. On the right side it's telling you what are you going to add it to, and that means your Lightroom catalog. And below that you have a few options. Before I get in here to do this, one thing you should be aware of, and the default setting might be turned off because when I first went in here uh, earlier today, uh, it was turned off, and that is in the upper left, there's a checkbox called include subfolders. If you happen to have already um, organized your images into a bunch of subfolders. Maybe it's based on year. Let's say you go to the 2012 folder and within it you have separate folders for all your shoots. You could click on that 2012 folder and then just turn on include subfolders and therefore it'll get everything that's inside those um, enclosed folders. Whereas if I turn that off, it will only get things that are in the exact folder that I've highlighted here and if there are any subfolders to it, it would ignore those files. So include subfolders, I almost always have that on. 
Okay, I'm going to click import in the lower right. And now Lightroom is going to start importing those images and creating previews. You'll see in the upper left is where you had a progress bar. When that's done, it's done creating its previews. And we can look at our images. So let's take a look at some of the things we can do in here. In the middle portion of the screen is where we're going to see our images. And on the left and on the right, we have these panels we can use to make various changes. The panel on the right, we're not going to talk about until the second or third day. So right now, it's just taking up space that's not overly useful. So I'm going to collapse the panel on the right. There's just a triangle on the right edge of my screen that I'll click on to collapse that panel. If I wanted to collapse any of the other panels, I can do the same thing. Just go to the edge of the screen where you find a triangle, and you could collapse it down. Click the triangle again to expand it. And so if you want to collapse the one at the top, there'll be a triangle up there you can do it with. And some of you working in Lightroom will find a panel at the bottom of your screen that also contains thumbnails. It's known as the film strip. And that's something we're not going to use yet. And so I'm hiding it just to make it so we have the most space for our uh, main thumbnails. But you can do that by clicking on the triangle at the bottom of your screen. So here's our thumbnails. Uh, to control how large they are, in the lower right, we have our thumbnail slider. If I grab that thing and start moving it, we're going to make them larger or smaller. If you prefer to use your keyboard for most things, you can use the plus and minus keys all by themselves. Minus key will make them smaller, plus key will make them bigger. Does the exact same thing as moving the slider. So once you get used to Lightroom a lot, and you start using a lot of keyboard shortcuts, plus and minus I find to be a little more useful uh, than the slider. Just seems to be a little faster for me. If you find any images in here that are not rotated properly, they're sideways when they shouldn't be, like let's say this one that I have selected, you can click on it once to select it. And you can get some arrows to appear down at the bottom of your screen to rotate those images. Or if you mouse over the image itself, you hopefully will see little rotation arrows in the lower right and lower left of the thumbnail. There's a little arrow here, you can rotate it, and there's an arrow on the opposite side to rotate it the opposite direction. Those don't show up on my version of Lightroom, at least, unless I move my mouse over the thumbnail for my image. Then you see those little rotation icons. There is a choice in Lightroom, though, that would make those not appear. Uh, and so on some versions of Lightroom, if you're trying this at home, you might find that they don't show up. Later on today, I'll show you how to control what shows up around your picture so that you'll know how to turn them on and off. But for now, uh, I'll just show you a different method. So if yours are not visible, you'll know, still know how to rotate things. The bar at the bottom, where we have our little thumbnail slider, control how big our thumbnails are, we can control what's in that bar. To control what's in the bar, go to the right side of it where you'll find a down pointing arrow. If you click on that down pointing arrow, you'll simply have a choice as of what could appear in that bar. And in the menu, you'll see little check boxes of what's currently there. Uh, and here's a choice called rotate. So if I want little rotation icons there, I can get them to show up. All I need to do is click on the down pointing arrow on the right edge of that bar. You can also do this for rating, flagging, all sorts of other things. But for me, these are the main ones that I have uh, chosen uh, to have visible most of the time. And so now if I want to rotate any image, I can just click on the image to make it active and just use the arrows down at the bottom. If you're one of those people, though, that loves keyboard shortcuts, some love them, some hate them, you can also rotate your images using your keyboard. To rotate using your keyboard, what you need to do is on a Mac, hold down the Command key. On Windows, that would be the Control key. And then use the square bracket keys on your keyboard. They look like kind of half squares. Although I've heard that on some international keyboards that they're not there. And if so, I won't know the keyboard shortcut. You could probably find it out by looking under the photo menu. That's where you'll find a choice of rotate left and rotate right. For those of you with international keyboards that might not have the bracket keys, just look at what's listed to the right of that. And it should list the keyboard shortcuts, hopefully, for your keyboard.
So we've got a rotation. We have many different ways, just like with most Adobe products, there are usually about three to five ways of doing things. With rotation, you can move on top of your thumbnail. You'll find the arrows showing up. You can go to the bottom of your screen, get the arrows showing up there. You can go to the photo menu and find rotate left, rotate right, or you can use the keyboard. And it can seem a little overwhelming with that many choices, and it's just a matter of just picking the one you like, and then you only need to know about one way to do it. If you ever get to somebody else's version of Lightroom, though, you might find that some of the choices in this bottom bar aren't there, and just remember you go on the far right to choose what shows up in the bar. All right, let's import some more photos. I'm going to hit the import button in the lower left. And I'm going to navigate to another folder. Here I have some images I shot in Africa. Now when you're importing your images, on the left side is where you're getting the images from. Remember in the middle top is what you're doing to those images. And if they're already stored where you'd like them to be on your hard drive, just choose add. And on the right side, it pretty much gives you details about what, where they're going. It's just saying it's going into my catalog. And up here at the top is a choice called render previews. And that's an important choice. If I click on this little menu, I have some choices. And the one that I use the most just to make things go fast is called embedded in sidecar. And what that means is just grab any previews of these images that are already built into the files themselves. If we tell it to do anything more than that, it'll actually have to open every one of the pictures and then scale it down to whatever size preview you told it to make and then save that preview. And that takes a lot more time than just looking at the file itself to see if there's any previews attached to it. So the last time we imported, we used embedded in sidecar and it just grabbed any previews that are already there. The problem with doing that is if you want to be able to check focus on your pictures and zoom up to 100% view, the moment you start zooming up to 100% view, it will say loading and it'll take a while for it to show up. Some of the images that I have in this particular folder are panoramas that have been stitched that are humongous. I mean, some of these files, we were looking at them earlier. Do you remember how big they are? Like 190 inches was one of them, wasn't it? 119 inches. 119, okay. 119 inches wide by, I think, 13 inches tall at 240 uh, for the resolution, which is a pretty darn big file. And if I end up trying to preview that, um, in Lightroom, it might take a while for it to load that preview. So in this particular menu, we have some choices. Embedded in Sidecar is what I use the most because I just want things to happen quickly, so use what's already there. Standard is just a predefined size, and in your preferences, you can choose what it is. If you were to choose a size that's close to the size of your screen, that might work uh, relatively well for it to create those previews, and one-to-one -one means full-size previews, and that's the choice that would be good if you need to check focus on your pictures. And so if you find you really need to check focus, let's say you're shooting uh, people and you really need to make sure their eyes are in focus, otherwise the shot's just not usable, then you'd want a one-to-one -one preview. With these images, since I know I have some panoramas and other things, right now I'm going to choose one-to-one -one preview, and I'm going to hit the import button. When I do that, at the top of my screen, if I get it to show up, it's going to take a while for it to render one-to-one -one previews. For the small images, it'll go rather quickly, but for my big panoramas, it might take a while. But I can continue working in Lightroom and doing things. Uh, I don't have to wait for that. Only if I want to preview them to check focus might I need them. I Pleasure. assume the embedded in sidecar is really only useful in your case here because you already had gone through the pictures. If I'm pulling them directly off out of the camera, off the card, whatever, then there is no embedded um, your sidecar, right? There is an embedded preview. Uh, your camera creates a preview for your image, at least a thumbnail okay. preview. And that's what you're seeing on the back of your camera as you're viewing the image. And so they will have some previews built into them. They're just not very large. And so oftentimes I just want to get quick thumbnail uh, kind of views of my images because I might want to organize them, copy some over to somebody else's drive, that kind of thing. And I find those particular previews to be helpful. Uh, so, but there is uh, previews built into most files off your digital camera. So anyway, this is going to take a little while. While it's rendering, I can still do things. Uh, I can view my images and all that. Um, I just can't view them at 100% view without it finishing it creating those previews. So let's figure out a few of the things that uh, we can do. If I click on an image, looking at it as a thumbnail is not the most useful. 
So there are a couple different ways of zooming up on the picture. At the bottom of my screen are two icons that you might want to get used to. And those two icons are this guy, which is what's generically known as grid view. That's where you see your image's thumbnails. The one next to it is what's known as loop view, and that's where you're going to see your image fill the screen. So if I click on that second icon, my image should fill the screen. Go back to grid view or fill the screen. To be honest, I never click on those icons, but that's what they're for. I need to do that so often that if there's one set of keyboard shortcuts you want to get used to if you're ever going to use Lightroom, it's the following two. And that is the spacebar to get the image to fill your screen and the letter G to go back to the grid. Spacebar, grid. Spacebar, grid. Spacebar actually does two things though. The first time you press it, it makes your image fill the screen. If you press it a second time, it gets you to 100% view. So you can check focus. Then to get back, if you just hit the spacebar again, it zooms you back out to fit on screen. So spacebar should bring you to 100% or fit in window. 100% fit in window, and you have to hit G to go back to the grid. Those are things that I would get so used to that if you have a little sheet of paper next to you and you want to commit something to memory, I'd write it down. It's seared into my brain. When you're zoomed up, you can just click on your picture to move around and to check it out. And if you want to be able to do this quickly, that's when you're going to want those one-to-one -one previews. I see Lightroom just finished creating them. You see the progress bar from the upper left is now gone. And so now we should be able to go through these relatively quickly. If I want to look at just all the images I shot, these are all from Africa, what I can do is hit the space bar and then use the arrow keys on my keyboard to cycle through my images. I'll just use the right arrow key and you'll see some of the shots I took in Africa. Let's see if I can view it bigger. I'll hit spacebar again. This is a massively huge file, and so it even there took a moment for it to get the preview to show up because the preview is so huge. It took a moment for it to switch it in memory, but if you take a look at that guy, and I hit the spacebar again to, to zoom out to uh, fit in window size. You can see how detailed that file is. Here's another one, spacebar. See how it's not showing up instantly? It does have the preview. It just took a while for it to load it. And I can see that this file could use some adjustment. It looks purplish and, and uh, a little grainy. I love your shots, I just want to say. Oh, thanks. It's incredible. Oh, well, if, if, I don't know if you've been to Africa or not, but what blows you away in Africa is here we are so close to this thing that you're blown away. When you see this, they walk right around your vehicle. They might even brush into the vehicle a little, and they don't care about you as long as you stay in the vehicle. Thank Step you. off the vehicle, though, and you might be considered food. Uh, so... Anyway, I'm just using arrow keys to go through my images. If I need to check focus, uh, I can come in and hit the space bar to get a 100% view, click and drag to move around. All right. Let's import some more images. So I'm going to go again to the import. And this time, instead of just importing one folder at a time, I'm going to just come in and on the left side it shows me the uh, name of my folders. I'm going to just choose the parent folder, the one that contains all those subfolders that I was wanting to import. I'll click on it so it gets all of these subfolders. I just need to make sure include subfolders is turned on so it can get the ones that are contained within it. In here you'll find some of the images are grayed out. That's because they're already in Lightroom. And so it grays them out saying that you can't unimport that in here so it just makes them disappear or gray out. Down here you can see the ones I haven't worked with yet. I'm not going to do one-to-one -one previews though with those. It would take too long to do it. To make it fast, I'm going to choose Embedded in Sidecar, and I'm just going to hit the Import button. And it'll import any images that were in those folders that I hadn't imported before. Progress bar is in the upper left, but I can continue to work even when that's going. I don't have to wait for it. Uh, so I can just go navigate my folders. So let's look at folders. On the left side of my screen, it says folders, and it starts off with the name of my hard drive. And if I look closely at that, do you see here's the name of my hard drive, and it has a little green thing next to it. 
That green thing is supposed to be like the power light on your hard drive. And it simply means that the hard drive is currently connected. If I were to disconnect the hard drive, then that little, uh, I'll, I'll call it a light, is going to turn gray, and the name of my hard drive is going to turn black, just to make it look different than the others. And that would mean that's a hard drive I don't have connected. And that's a frequent thing because oftentimes I travel with my laptop and my big store of photos stays at home on a big hard drive. And so they might be missing. And if so, that'll be a gray light with uh, black text here. On the right side of the name of the hard drive, we have the capacity of the hard drive and how much space is open on the hard drive. If you forget that, just mouse over it without clicking and just hover for a second and it will tell you what it means. It tells you free space and total space. Below that, we have my folders. So if I click on the little triangle, I can expand it. If you ever see a folder that has a gray triangle next to it, it means that that particular folder contains subfolders. There are more folders inside. So if I look at right there, that means we have a subfolder. If instead it is, looks like little specks of a triangle, that means there are no subfolders. So let's see what we can do here to um, edit these down. I'm going to work on a folder that I shot in Iceland. I've been to Iceland, I don't know how many times. I'm guessing it's seven or eight. Maybe it's six or seven. You lose count after you've been there about four or five times. And I'm going back uh, twice this year. It's a beautiful country. And if you've only heard about it verbally, uh, people think it's icy. Uh, no, it's Greenland that's icy. And it's Iceland that's green. And uh, it's a, actually a relatively short flight from the east coast of the US. Uh, and it's a visually stunning country. You will be sick and tired of waterfalls by the time you leave. You'll be ignoring them left and right. So let's take a look at what we could do here with our folders. You see the title folders on the left side and there's a plus and minus button next to them. The plus button has a little arrow pointing down next to it. Anytime you see a little bitty arrow pointing down, it usually means there's a menu hidden there. So that means that the plus button isn't just a button, it's actually a pop-up menu. If I click there, I can tell it that I want to add a subfolder within my Iceland folder. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to create one called Waterfalls. When I create a subfolder, there is a checkbox for including selected photos. But I haven't selected any images that contain waterfalls yet, so I don't want to do that. But if I had already looked through and found all the images that contain waterfalls and I had them selected, then I might turn that on. But for now, I'll just choose Create. And now if I look at my folder list, the little triangle next to Iceland went from being grayed out to being usable. And I can expand it and see my subfolders. The subfolder is, its text is in gray. Can you see that compared to the others? And that just means it's empty. Once I start putting stuff in there, it will become more prominent and turn more of a white shade. All right, so let's start moving some images into that folder. I'll make my thumbnails bigger. And anytime I see a waterfall, I'm going to click on it and I'm just going to drag it over on top of the waterfall folder. Now, this is just telling you the very first time you do this that, I'll, and I'll choose Don't Show Again, if I choose Move, it's actually going to move that on my hard drive. So whatever I change in this folder list, like the name of a folder or which images are in that folder, it's going to make sure that's reflected on your hard drive, just like working with the files and other programs that, uh, that do that. So I'm just going to come over here and drag them over. It can tell me if there's a file that's already there. In this case, it's dragging a copy. Uh, that one I already dragged uh, earlier, so it's just telling me that. I'm going to drag more of these. Hold on, if I can get. To select more than one image, you have a few choices. If you hold down the Shift key, you're going to select from the image you currently have uh, highlighted to the next one you're clicking on. You'll get the whole series in between them if you hold Shift. If you want them not to be in order, though, if you want to get just individual files, you can hold down the Command key, Control and Windows, and then click on Individual Images. So I'll do that and get any more waterfalls that I see.
In Iceland, if you go to a waterfall, unlike here where you might find a guardrail keeping you back, like if you're at Niagara Falls or something here, in Iceland, the most I've ever seen uh, holding you back from putting your arm in a waterfall is a rope. And I mean a really loose rope that's more like what you'd make a rope fence out of or something. And uh, so it's really easy to get to things. That's why on one of these here, I got my finger right in it. And that's a huge waterfall. What's the best time of year to, to go over there? Uh, best time of year to go to Iceland, it really depends what you want to capture if you're a photographer. If you go there, and I could be off a little bit on the timing, but if you go there, I think it's June, July, uh, you're going to have the time when the sun will go down, but it never goes down so far that the sky turns black. So you have a lot of shooting time. You can shoot like crazy. Uh, if you go there, uh, let's say in the next few months, you know, in the winter time, it's going to be easier to see the northern lights in the sky. Uh, you'll be able to find icy waterfalls, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it really depends what you're trying to shoot. But I don't know that I've been there in a enough variety of seasons to really tell you uh, when. But I, I would say the like July time frame isn't bad. Um, all right. So anyway, I got my waterfalls. Now, if I come in here, now I can click on that folder, see its uh, contents. And you know that's been reflected on my hard drive. So if I leave Lightroom and I go and look on my hard drive at the folder that we've been working with, I'll see if I can find it here. Here's all the Iceland files. And if I keep looking, I should find a subfolder called Waterfalls, which was made within Lightroom, but was reflected on my hard drive. I come in here and there's all those files. Now the problem is any changes I make in Lightroom are reflected on my hard drive, that's great, but if I make the same kind of changes outside of Lightroom, if I do it here in my operating system or I do it in another program, then Lightroom's not going to necessarily be aware of it, especially if Lightroom is not running. So right now I'm going to come in here and take out a few of these images. In fact, let's take out darn near half of them. And I'm just going to bring them to the trash can. Get rid of them. If we return to Lightroom and look in the same folder, as long as Lightroom is running, you might notice some things. We, we have a, a good number of images. But if you look, when Lightroom is running, it goes and looks at the hard drive. And if it notices that it can't find any of the images, you're going to find that it puts a little question mark in the upper right corner. And that means you imported this file, but it can't currently find it. So we can still organize that. We can still like move this uh, into what's known as collections or create slideshows with them and things like that. But if we want to be able to adjust the image, we want to be able to print the image, or we want to be able to export the image to give it to somebody else, we're going to need to find that file and get it back. If I simply move those files back into the folder, the question mark go away. Let's also say that I copied a few images manually on my hard drive. Remember, in general, we had two um, rows of images plus one extra, as far as how many are there. I'm going to hide Lightroom, go to my operating system here, and let's just copy some files manually into that folder. I'm going to grab a bunch of images here and just drag them into the Waterfalls folder, doing it outside of Lightroom. Now, let's go back to Lightroom, and you notice that no, it doesn't show us any more files. And that's because Lightroom only displays that stuff that you've imported into it. And we didn't import those particular images from this folder. Also, if I go to the parent folder, the one called Iceland, since I physically moved those files instead of copying them, there might be some files in here that have question marks on them, although I don't see it right now. Maybe I moved a copy. If I want Photoshop to take a fresh look at my hard drive, to see if there's been any changes on my hard drive, and to therefore update what I see here, what I want to do is move my mouse on top of the name of the folder, over here in the folder list, and press my right mouse button. If you're on a Mac and you only have one mouse button, you can hold down the control key and click to get the same feature as if you have a right mouse button. If I control click or right click on any folder in Lightroom, I'll get a menu. And within that menu, one of the choices I'm going to find is synchronized folder. 
When I choose synchronized folder, this comes up. And what synchronized means is to try to get Lightroom to reflect again what's on my hard drive, to get them in sync. And so it's gonna go look at my hard drive and sometimes this can take some time if you have a bunch of images, but it'll tell me right here, I have seven new photos that are found on that hard drive. Those are the ones I copied into the folder. And then it found that there were 10 images missing. Remember I deleted them? And so if I choose synchronize, it's going to make sure Lightroom now reflects what's on my hard drive. So you'll find the images that have the question marks are going to go away and the images that were missing are going to show up. The only thing is when you do anything like synchronizing or importing, it doesn't just bring you back to the same view you had previously. It brings you to a special view. If you look near the upper left of my screen, there's a choice called previous import. And anytime you've, the last thing you did was import or synchronize, it's gonna send you to this view called previous import. And what that means is it's showing the new stuff you just put into Lightroom. If I wanna get back to what we were looking at before, then I need to navigate back to that folder. I'll just click on the word waterfalls over here. And I'm back now where I see both my waterfalls and the newly imported images, the ones I had manually copied over there. So just remember in Lightroom, you're only gonna see that which you import. So if you make any changes outside of Lightroom and you expect to see them here, you're gonna need to go to the folder if it's already been imported. You wanna press the right mouse button on it and that's where you're gonna find synchronized folder. That means make sure they're in sync, the, your hard drive in Lightroom. Whereas if those images are ones that are in a folder that you've never imported into Lightroom, then hit the import button instead and go say, hey, there's a new folder over here, I want you to know about it. But if it's in a folder that's already existing, that's when you right click, synchronize folder. Okay? All right, let's uh, look at some other images. Let's look at how we could edit down a shoot. Let's say we shot a bunch of images that are rather similar, and here I have a folder called Edit Down, and that's exactly what I have. Here I have a bunch of horses running on the beach. And that's a lot of shots. I need to figure out which ones do I think are worth working on and getting rid of the ones that are out of focus or just bad. And so let's look at a few different ways of doing that. First off, if I'm gonna need to check focus on every image, I would probably wanna have one-to-one -one previews. Remember that, where it's a full-size preview? I could have done that when I imported the pictures, but I don't know that I did when I imported these. I think I had it set to, what was that setting called? Embedded in sidecar? The one that just does it quickly? So one thing, uh, if you want to be able to check focus, is I could select all. To select all, you can type Command A on a Mac, Control A in Windows. And then under the library menu is a choice called previews. And this is where you could force Lightroom to create one-to-one -one previews, which means full-size previews. And that would make it so you could quickly check focus on each image. If you didn't have those one-to-one -one previews, when you zoom up to 100% view, you would have it say loading, and you'd have to sit there and wait on each image. For these particular images though, I'm not gonna check focus. I'm just gonna look overall at the composition and, and all that. So I'm not worried about one-to-one -one previews, just so you're aware. All right, let's see if we can narrow these down, just to the ones that are, uh, are nice. I notice a few of these have been adjusted already in Photoshop. If you notice, or, or I shouldn't say in Photoshop, in Lightroom, uh, if you notice some of them look much more yellow and warm, uh, I'll notice that on those particular images, there's a little icon with a plus and minus on it that's an indication that they've already been adjusted. We'll talk more about those little icons later on. I'm gonna just do something quick so these images have not been adjusted. We'll talk about what I'm doing later on. I'm just gonna <coughs> make sure they're not adjusted. So I went to a special menu that had a choice called reset, but we're not talking about it yet because we haven't even talked about adjusting the images yet. Just know there is a way and you'll learn it later. Okay, here goes. Want to get these narrowed down. So I'm going to click on the first image, making sure I don't have any others selected, and hit the space bar to get it to fill my screen. 
then there are many different ways I can do this. In the photo menu is a choice called set flag. That's what I'm going to use. Set flag. You can have your images in one of three different states when it comes to flags. You can flag it, which to me is going to mean it's one I might want to adjust. You can unflag it, which means just leave it alone or get rid of any flagging that was there, or you can reject it. So those are the things that I'm going to do. I don't want to go to this menu for every single picture though, so I'm going to use my keyboard to do it. And in general, I'm going to just go between flagged and unflagged right now. Because if you look on your keyboard, the letter P for flagged and the letter U for unflagged are relatively conveniently placed when it comes to my hand. And I can just put my hand where one finger is on the letter P, the other is on the letter U. And then when I'm viewing my picture, I can just use the arrow keys on my keyboard to go between them. This one I don't think is very exciting. So I'm not going to flag it. I'll use the right arrow key to cycle to the next image. I don't find it to be very exciting either. Keep going. Keep going. Until I find one I might like. And that one might be okay, so I'm going to hit the letter P. So at the very bottom of my screen, you'll notice a little flag icon. And that means it's been picked. The flag icon with an X on it would be rejected. You could click on those icons as an alternative to using the keyboard shortcuts, but in a moment you'll see why the keyboard shortcuts will be much better. Use the arrow keys to go to the next one, next one. Even though that's dark, if I like it, I can always adjust it in Lightroom. I can make that look dramatically better. So I'm going to hit P if I like it. And I'm just going to keep going, hitting P if I like things. Right arrow key, P if I like it. Hitting nothing if I don't. But you've noticed me doing this, I'm hitting the right arrow key and then the letter P a lot. There's another way to do it that can make it a little bit better. It's a feature in Lightroom that isn't self-explanatory, but it's called Auto Advance. And there are a couple different ways you can turn on Auto Advance. It's under one of the menus, either probably Library, or although it could be Photo. I don't know which menu because I never access it from the menu but it's under the photo menu called Auto Advance. Or the keyboard shortcut for doing it is to just turn on the Caps Lock key on your keyboard. So right now I'm going to turn on Caps Lock. Auto Advance is turned on now. And now if I type the letter P for pick or the letter U for unpick or whatever, it's going to automatically switch to the next photo. So let's say I don't like this image. I'll hit the letter U to unpick it. It brings me to the next photo. This one maybe I like, so I hit the letter P to pick it. This one I like, so I hit P. But each time I hit either the letter U for unpick or the letter P for pick, uh, it's going to automatically switch to the next photograph, and that's going to make it so I could go through these images so quick it's ridiculous. In fact, let's see. If I use one finger on the letter P and one on U, let's see how quick I can go through them. But doesn't that make it much more streamlined as far as being able to narrow down the pictures that you have? If you miss one, let's say you just accidentally hit the letter U, just use the arrow key to go back. You know, arrow key you can still use to navigate. So let's say I wanted that as a pick, but I just kind of automatically hit the wrong key. Uh, so I hit U if I find it to be uninteresting, you could think of, and P for pick. So pick, pick, pick. Uninteresting, 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 and that's all I'm doing. And just remember the arrow keys can be used if you accidentally hit the wrong key. So that's why I like using the letter U and the letter P. And then auto advance. Auto advance is turned on in one of two ways. The first is to press the caps lock key on your keyboard. The second is to go to the photo menu and choose auto advance. Does that make sense? And so once you've gone through that entire series of images, you can get back to the grid. And remember, there's a keyboard shortcut for grid. It's the letter G. Or if you forget it, it's the bottom of your images on the left side, 
bottom left, you'll find a little icon that represents the grid. You can click on it instead. Then when I look at my images after going through them, if I glance at them, I should see the little flag icon on those that I've chosen as a pick. Make sense? So you can very quickly narrow down a series of images. Now sometimes I'll narrow them down further, then I'll view only the picks, which we can do, and then I can rate them, that kind of stuff. But we'll talk more about that uh, type of stuff uh, in a little while. If you want to get into rating though, if you feel like uh, doing that, rating can be done under the photo menu. Here you'll find set rating, and you can choose your rating, or keyboard shortcut, just hit number keys, one through five. Some people find that to be more useful. I find it's useful to go through and do it as a pick first to see which ones I might even consider. And then I can view only those that are picked. And uh, after that, I might start doing ratings. 